Revelation 16, verse 16, then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Armageddon. Ever since John penned these words on the Isle of Patmos 2,000 years ago, men have pondered the significance, the meaning of Armageddon. Where is Armageddon? When is Armageddon? The last great war, the war that will end all wars. Practically every major war has been called Armageddon. World War I was thought to be Armageddon. World War II, Armageddon, the war that was supposed to end all wars. There's so many get it so wrong. And how can we be sure that we get it right? The answer to that question is that we have to apply the keys to understanding revelation and cracking the code. We have to apply the keys that we got from the book of Revelation itself. It begins with the words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That means revelation must center in and focus on whom? Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation quotes or alludes to the Old Testament over 600 times. You got it. Therefore, we have to have an Old Testament foundation before we'll ever understand Armageddon or Revelation. No private interpretation. Let the Bible interpret itself. We do that by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Very good. Revelation is a symbolic book, and we have to interpret the symbols. How do we know we get the symbols right? By comparing Scripture with Scripture. Armageddon is found only one time in the Bible. This is the only place that you'll ever see the word Armageddon in Scripture right here in Revelation 16, 16. You will not find it in the Old Testament. You'll not find it any place else in the New Testament. It's just right here. Now, when a word is mentioned only one time in the Scripture, then you have to be exceedingly careful in interpreting what it means in order to get it right. First of all, we have to look at it in its immediate context. The immediate context is that Armageddon and the gathering for Armageddon is the sixth of the seven last plagues. The actual battle of Armageddon is the seventh of the seven last plagues plagues. The plagues are found in the 16th chapter of Revelation. So we need to understand Armageddon in the setting of the seven last plagues within the larger setting of the book of Revelation and then within the even larger setting of the entire Bible including the Old Testament. So let's begin with the immediate context of Armageddon, which is the sixth of the seven last plagues. I want to start reading in verse 12, and I want you to picture in your minds what we read. It's important to get a clear image, a sharp focus of this prophecy of the sixth of the seven last plagues. And I also would like for you to ask yourself the question as we read through the sixth plague, where is Jesus? Because he's the center of all the prophecies, right? So ask yourself, where is Jesus? Revelation 16, verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. 
And then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Verse 16, they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So picture three evil spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet performing miracles, and they gather the kings together for battle on the great day of God Almighty that is Armageddon picture the angel pouring out his bowl on the Euphrates River. The waters of the Euphrates are dried up and that prepares the way for the kings that come from the east. So where's Jesus in all of this? Hold on. You're going to see an awesome, powerful prophecy. The picture to keep in mind, the angel pouring out his bowl on the Euphrates River. The river dried up, and the drying up of the Euphrates prepares the way for the kings from the east and the battle of Armageddon. The book of Revelation quotes the Old Testament 600 times, and that's one place. Daniel. The prophet Daniel. We're going to review a little bit. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. Look at it with me. In Daniel, the first chapter, we'll review a little and then we'll see some new things. Verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. Remember those golden cups? These he took back to the temple of his God in Babylon and put them in the treasure house of his God. So Nebuchadnezzar, that wicked pagan king, captured God's people, captured God's city. He captured the temple. He took the golden cups from the temple. He took the people of God captive back to Babylon and put those cups in the Babylonian temple. As we learned in another lesson, we saw Belshazzar in the middle of a drunken orgy asked for those golden cups, filled them with Babylonian wine, began to drink to the Babylonian gods, taking the cups that God had set aside and made holy and using them in a common ordinary way as though they were not holy just as he lifted the cup to his lips he saw a man's hand cut off and writing on the wall mene mene teko uparsin I'm just reviewing from a previous lesson Daniel came before the king to interpret the message that was written on the wall and he said remember the words Verse 22, your, your father acknowledged that the Lord was God, but you, O Belshazzar, you knew all of this, and in spite of that, you have set yourself up against the God of heaven, and you had those goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, your concubine, you drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone that cannot see, hear, or understand, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hands your life and all of your ways. That's why he sent the message. What did it say? Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Teko, you've been weighed on the balances and found wanting. In other words, the hour of God's judgment has come, isn't it? Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. In other words, Babylon has fallen. Here are the three angels' message already in a little bit of a nutshell preview form for the old, in the Old Testament. He, he knew what he was doing. In spite of the fact that he knew it was wrong, he trampled on those holy cups, and therefore the hour of God's judgment has come. He was judged, and Babylon has fallen. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Why? Because he didn't believe God. Because he didn't trust God. God. God said those cups were holy, and he said, no, I can do with them as I please. It's up to me to decide. 
which day to keep holy. Are you beginning to see the picture here? Babylon has fallen. He has brought your kingdom to an end. But Babylon was still standing when he made that announcement. How can God say Babylon has fallen when Babylon is still there? In fact, it wasn't until later that night in verse 30 that Belshazzar of the Babylonians was slain and Darius the Mede of the Medo-Persian Empire took over his kingdom at the age of 62. So Babylon fell that very night. Darius the Mede took over. Now how did Babylon fall? That's what we need to understand. How did Babylon fall? You see... The Bible tells us, and history confirms it. Babylon was a city that was built on the Euphrates River. The Euphrates went underneath the gate into the city and then out underneath the gate on the other side of the city. The Euphrates River was the lifeline of Babylon. Without the waters of the Euphrates, Babylon would die. So how did Babylon fall? King Cyrus, one of the Medo-Persian kings from the east, built a dam. Did you catch that? One of the kings from where? From the east? because that's where the Medo-Persian Empire was. It was the east of Babylon. He built a dam across the Euphrates River, diverting it around the city of Babylon and drying up the waters of the Euphrates. That enabled Cyrus's armies to march into the city of Babylon on the dry riverbed of the Euphrates underneath the gate into the city, catch them in the middle of their drunken orgy and capture Babylon without firing a shot, so to speak. Now does that sound familiar to you? The kings came from the east, dried up the Euphrates and captured Babylon. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the Euphrates River. Its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Wow. Now we can begin to understand this prophecy, except for one more thing. Cyrus. Who was that king Cyrus who came from the east and dried up the Euphrates River? That's the exciting part of this prophecy, turn to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah 41, verse 1, he speaks and says, Let us meet together at a place of judgment. So now he's talking about a place of judgment. Watch. Verse 2, Who has stirred one up from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? So here's one serving God in judgment, and he comes from the east. Chapter 42, verse 1, he comes in righteousness from the east. Chapter 42, verse 1, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. So he's called the servant. He's called the chosen one. Watch this, chapter 44, verse 27, who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I'll dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Remember when Israel was captive in Babylon, Jerusalem was in ruins and the temple was in ruins. So here he says, Cyrus, let it be rebuilt. Cyrus said, let the foundations be laid. Verse 1 of chapter 45, this is what the Lord says to his anointed one, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of. 
Verse 13, I'll raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I'll make all of his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free. Interesting that Isaiah refers to Cyrus as the servant, the shepherd, the righteous one, the chosen one. The one who God took his right hand. But the Bible says in the New Testament that Jesus is the servant. Jesus is the righteous one. Jesus is the chosen one. Jesus is the one whose right hand God took. You see, Cyrus is a type or a shadow of a greater king who would come from the east, King Jesus. And dry up the Euphrates River and set his people free. Why did God raise up the pagan king Cyrus to capture Babylon, dry up the Euphrates, capture Babylon, why did God raise up this pagan king to do that? Because Jerusalem was in ruins. And the temple was in ruins. And as long as the temple is in ruins, then the true worship of the true God doesn't exist on the earth. Because the temple is the center of God's worship. And so Cyrus was raised up by God in his righteousness to capture Babylon and to set God's exiles free so they could go back, rebuild the city, rebuild the temple, and restore the true worship of the true God. That's the purpose. Every prophecy has to have a purpose. God doesn't just predict the future like Sun Magazine tries to predict. God's prophecies are for a reason, for a purpose. Why did he raise up Cyrus? He raised him up so that he could capture Babylon, rebuild Jerusalem, let God's people free to restore the temple and restore the true worship of God. That's God's purpose for the prophecy. You know, there's something else about this prophecy that I really like. Did you notice it called Cyrus by name? Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of? It mentions Cyrus by name. Now, why is that so exciting? Well, to me, it's exciting because Cyrus wasn't born until hundreds of years later. So that means that God knew Cyrus by name hundreds of years before he was even born. Well, why is that exciting? It's exciting because if God knew Cyrus by name hundreds of years before he was born, then God must know you by name. Even before you were born, God knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows your name. He knows what you do. He knows where you are. Before you were born, He knew you would be sitting right here listening to the Word of God. He knew what your decisions would be as you heard the Word of God unfold. He knew whether you would follow the Lamb or not. God knows you. That doesn't take away your choice. He just knows us and He knows what we're going to do, but we still have a choice. Wow. What a God. He knows me. He knows you. He knows the disappointments, the heartache that you're suffering right now at this very moment. He's walked that path. He knows what rejection is like. He knows what abuse is like. He's been here. And he knows what you're feeling right now. What a God. Amen? So picture it again. 
Cyrus, the king from the east, dries up the Euphrates River, captures Babylon, sets God's exiles free, back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and to restore the true worship of God. Cyrus, then, is a type or a shadow foreshadowing a greater king who would come from the east. Didn't Jesus say, as lightning flashes from the east to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be? Cyrus foreshadowed the coming of a greater king who sees his end-time people captive in Babylon, dries up the Euphrates to deliver his people and restore the true worship of the true God. How does it all unfold? Now we're ready to see it. Let's go back to Revelation. This time, Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation, the 19th chapter, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Why? What's the big event? Because the wedding of the Lamb has come. And the bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Who is the bride? Verse 9, chapter 21. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. So one of the angels with the last plagues came to explain things. And he said to me, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Who is the bride? Verse 10. He carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain great and high, and he showed me the holy city coming down out of heaven from God. So who is the bride? It's the holy city. It's the new Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven from God. But when we compare Scripture with Scripture, and we go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 22, it tells us, You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. So you, church, when you come to Jesus, he said, you have come to Mount Zion. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to the city of the living God. Verse 23, you have come to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men. You've come to Jesus. So the moment we come to Jesus, our names are written in heaven, and we are citizens of the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. We are citizens in that city. Our names are written there, but we're still down here. But the bride has made herself ready. The new Jerusalem is the bride, but the people aren't there. Our names are just written there. And so Jesus is saying, it's time for me to go and to get my bride. It's time for me to go and to get my people. They are ready. The three angels' messages have gone to the whole world. My people have responded. They are following the Lamb. They've demonstrated what it means to follow the Lamb. I'm going to go and get my people. Problem is, is people are in the claws of Babylon trying to destroy them. No problem. Because verse 11 tells us I saw heaven standing and open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one but he himself knows. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. 
The armies of heaven are following him, dressed, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he'll rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus Christ is coming, riding on a white horse, to capture his people from Babylon, to snatch her from the jaws of death, and to bring her to the new Jerusalem to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Wow. Revelation is all about Jesus. He's the king who comes from the east. Verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, all of them, and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. Now you got to picture this. Jesus is coming for his bride. He's coming for us. The kings of the earth, the beast, the false prophet, all their armies are gathered together to make war. Against whom? Not against Israel. It never says the war is against Israel. They're gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse. That's Jesus. Armageddon is the devil and his armies against Jesus, or Jesus against them, however you want to look at it, because they are trying to crush the life out of the bride of the Lamb, and he is coming to deliver us. That's what Armageddon is all about. It's not over geographic boundaries set by the United Nations and fought over by the Middle Eastern countries. It's not about that. It's about Jesus and his bride and those who are trying to crush the bride of Christ. So watch it again. Saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse. If you ever get discouraged, read Revelation 17, 15. Actually, read Revelation 17, 12 and following. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose. They'll give their power and authority to the beast. All the kings of the earth. They're not fighting against each other. No. They give all of their authority to the beast. They're fighting against whom? Verse 14. They'll make war against the Lamb. Don't get discouraged. Sometimes he attacks us. He's going to attack us. He's going to keep attacking us. But watch. Watch. But the Lamb will overcome them <laughs> because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Follow the Lamb. You want to win this war? Follow the Lamb. He's going to win. So the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, the kings of the earth, and all of their armies are gathered together to make war against the Lamb, against Jesus, the rider on the white horse. Where are they gathered to? We've already read that, but let's read it again. Verse 13, I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs that came out of the mouth of the dragon. You know what? I want to start at verse 12 because that gives us a bigger picture here. Verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Is it getting clear to you now? He poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. That's Jesus. And then I saw three evil spirits. They looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. They're spirits of demons, and they perform miraculous signs. They go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. So where are they gathering them to? Verse 16 says, They gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The beast, the kings of the earth, 
the false prophet, all of their armies are gathered together to a place called Armageddon to make war against the Lamb. He's going to lose that one every time. But where is Armageddon? When we did a revelation now over in the Middle East, after we were finished, we went to tour through Israel and went up to the northern parts of Israel to a little place called Megiddo. You may have heard about it. And there's a little hill overlooking the big valley of Ezralon, and, and we were there on Megiddo. And there was a sign. This is Armageddon, the place of the last great war. But it was a plain and a little hill. And it was Megiddo, not Armageddon. So do we want to trust the rabbis who don't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior to interpret a New Testament prophecy that centers on Jesus Christ? Practically the whole Christian world does. But I see something else there when I look through the eyes of Jesus. Where's Armageddon? Remember, that word's only found one place in your Bible. That's Revelation 16, 16. And actually, John gives us a clue. He said, they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, this is the New Testament. The New Testament was not written in Hebrew. So I think John is telling us, if you want to understand Armageddon, you better know a little Hebrew. At least one word, or actually three, two words. Armageddon is from the Hebrew har, the H is silent, and it means mountain. Megiddo, from Megiddo, means slaughter. The dragon the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies, all the wicked are gathered to the mountain of slaughter to make war against the Lamb. God's people are gathered to Mount Zion to worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. There are two mountains in Revelation, two gatherings in Revelation, one to Mount Zion, the Lamb is there, and one to Armageddon, the mountain of slaughter, and the beast is there. That's the last great war, and it will end all wars. Now we're ready to go to the broader scope of that prophecy in the wider context of Revelation. And I want to kind of sweep through from Revelation, the 12th chapter, up until the end. And I'm going to paint in broad strokes the big picture because when you have the big picture, then you can go through and study the details. Then the beast and 666 and the mark and Armageddon all fall into place. But if you just take one here and one there without the big picture, you don't know where to hang it. And it gets confusing. But watch how simple and clear Revelation is now. Chapter 12, verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. He was not strong enough. They lost their place in heaven. We know about that war. That war was over who's going to rule. Satan wanted to sit on God's throne. God's laws are laws of love. Satan wanted to put his laws in place of God's laws. 
God could have destroyed Satan right then in heaven, remember? We've talked about all this. Why didn't he? When Lucifer, that perfect angel in heaven, was trying to deceive all the angels into following him instead of God, entrusting him instead of God, God could have walked in and destroyed him right then. Why didn't he? Wouldn't it have been better if he would have stopped this thing before it started? No, because if he would have destroyed Lucifer, then all the other angels would be worshiping God out of fear instead of love, and they would have never known that God's laws are laws of love. So he had to let Lucifer go. He had to give him time to demonstrate what it would be like if he really had a kingdom to rule and the bad news is that he was hurled down to the earth and his evil angels with him. Bad news for us. You say, well, it's not fair. Why didn't he send him to some other Pluto or someplace else? There's nothing fair about sin. But there's everything fair about God. And he's going to make it up to you far greater than what, what could, you could ever dream or imagine. Verse 13, when the dragon saw he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Now remember, we studied and learned that the woman symbolizes God's people. If she's the pure woman, that harlot dressed in scarlet and purple, the adulterous woman symbolizes a counterfeit to God's people. So this time we see a woman is the pure woman clothed with the sun. In the Old Testament, that woman is the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, that woman symbolizes the church of Jesus Christ. So we have to ask ourselves, when John saw the dragon pursuing this woman, is it in Old Testament time or is it in New Testament times? Old Testament would be Israel. New Testament, it would be the church. You see, the cross is the determining factor as to how to understand Revelation. When we see that the dragon had been hurled to the earth and he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, Jesus had already come. So it must be the New Testament woman, the church of Jesus Christ. Shouldn't surprise us because we had already studied that the woman was given in verse 14 the wings of a great eagle. She might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for time, times, and half a time. Same thing that Daniel saw, the Antichrist would be in power time, times, and half a time. So during that time, times, and half a time that we've already studied was 1260 years from 538 until 1798, the woman is hidden in the desert. God has always had followers, believers who would follow the Lamb. Always even in the darkest times of the Dark Ages. So now we're through the Dark Ages, 1798. After that, from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman, sweep her away with torrent. And we know that symbolizes war, trying to destroy the people of God. That happened during the Dark Ages. Europe just about wiped the, the, the true believers off the face of the earth. During the... the Spanish Inquisitions, the St. Bartholomew Massacre, and all the other times when those who stood on the Scripture were slaughtered, their blood was flowing in the streets. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth. The first beast came up out of the water, representing multitudes of people, but this second beast comes up out of the earth after the deadly wound. So around the turn of the century, the late 1700s, we see another beast rising, quiet, uninhabited part of the world, relatively compared to Europe, and he had two horns like a lamb. We already identified that one as Protestant America. The United States of America, when the pilgrims came to this country to escape the persecution, establish a nation where they have the freedom to worship God as they choose, but she spoke like the dragon. America's going to change. America is changing. And we're seeing our freedoms eroding away slowly but surely. We still have the right to worship as we please. Praise God for that. 
but there are some in very influential circles in government that would consider the prophecies that we've been talking about as hateful and would even ban them. Did you know that your United States Senate and your United States House of Representatives had a motion on the floor to ban and make illegal any interpretations of prophecy that pointed to the Vatican as the Antichrist and the beast. Fortunately, it was voted down. But one of these days, it's going to be voted up. We've already seen, as I read to you from the document produced by the Department of Homeland Security, we've already seen that those who focus on end-time prophecies are more likely to be candidates for terrorism than other, other parts of the population. We're already singled out. Our freedoms are being stripped away. I want to show you some things. How could that ever happen here in the United States of America? I found this when I was reading a book that was written about 300 years before Christ was born. It wasn't written by a Bible prophet. It was written by a pagan philosopher. His name was Plato. The book was The Republic. And I had chills going up and down my back when I read it. See if you think he wasn't talking about our times. It's a little long, but bear with me. All forms of government destroy themselves by carrying their basic principles to excess. The first form is monarchy. That's a king ruling. And the principle is unity of rule carried to excess. The rule is too unified and the monarch or the king takes too much power to himself. The leading families rebel and they establish an aristocracy whose main principle is that selected families rule. The principle of selection is carried to excess and somewhat large numbers of able men are left out. The middle class join them in rebellion and they establish a democracy whose principle is liberty. And that's us. But this principle too is carried to excess in the course of time. The democracies become too free. Now this was written 350 years before Christ. This principle is carried to excess in the course of time. The democracies become too free until at last even the puppy dogs in our own homes rise on their hind legs and demand their rights. Watch out now. It's called animal rights. Now don't misunderstand me. I believe that God made us stewards over this earth and the animals and that we need to take care of the animals and protect them. They're God's creatures. But it's possible to go to extremes and excess and people have done jail time for plowing up accidentally a kangaroo rat that was an endangered species in their cornfield. And there are so many things now that can't be done because it might infringe on animal rights and scare the rattlesnakes out of their natural habitat. Some people don't even want me to go scuba diving. Because when I jump off the boat, it causes trauma to the fish. <laughs> now, we can go to extremes. And that's what Plato was talking about. So everybody's demanding their rights. Picture this. Everybody thinks they have something coming to them. So what happens when they don't get what they think they have coming to them? 
that's when you start seeing demonstrations that turn into riots and anarchy. We've almost had that a few times in some of our elections when people thought their vote wasn't counting. Remember the chads? We were on the brink of anarchy in some places and rioting. Disorder grows to such a point that a society will abandon all of its liberties to anyone who can restore order. And then comes the fourth form of government, tyranny, dictatorship, and the monarchy may be restored and the process begins all over again, not this time. There will be a monarch, there will be a king, but this process isn't going to happen all over again. In this kind of an environment, and in the political and economic crisis that we're facing in this country and are going through now, it doesn't take much of an imagination to see people believing that they're not getting their rights, getting anxious, demonstrating, and even rioting to get what they believe is their right. The stage is ripe for a powerful political leader to emerge, performing miracles, saying, I have the answer. People will abandon their freedoms to anyone who can promise them order. The stage is set, folks, for worldwide super church. And this is in, from an email newsletter that I get from Dr. Robert Moynihan from Rome called Inside the Vatican. He announced that the Protestant Anglican Church is now being invited by Rome to reunite with Rome and keep their Anglican traditions. The priests can continue to marry. These things will still be okay, but they must recognize the authority of the Pope in matters of truth. He said, this will be seen as one of the historic documents of Pope Benedict XVI's pontificate. We are watching history unfold here. But this, he said, is just one part of a larger papal strategy and vision which opens outward towards Orthodox churches, other Protestant churches, and which also has to do with a mysterious message from Fatima, an appearance of Mary with prophecies that were locked up and no one really knew what they were. But now they're beginning to unfold those prophecies. But Mary died 2,000 years ago. Messages that come from beyond the grave. Remember, I saw demon spirits performing miracles, gathering the world together, bringing them together for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Are you seeing what's happening? And that isn't all. The next day, he said, he was on a train approaching Tatarstan, gateway to the Stan countries. Beyond Tatarstan is Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, countries that are all part of the Muslim world. He was going to Kazan, the capital of Tatarstan, and Kazan reflects that as half of its population is Muslim and the other half Orthodox Protestant Russians of the Orthodox Protestant Church. The first glimpse of Kazan that I catch at dawn as the train pulls into the city is the mosque with its minarets and domes of the cathedral side by side. Mosque and the Protestant cathedral side by side. But the fascinating thing about Kazan is it is known throughout the world as a city of tolerant coexistence. There is no evident tension whatsoever between the Muslims in the city and the Christians in the city. And this, I believe, is a part of the mystery of the icon of Kazan, which came from Fatima. So here we are using spirits from beyond the grave to bring peace and harmony between Muslims and Christians. And they're attributing it to a vision from beyond the grave. I don't know how prophecy can unfold any clearer than it is right now. We're living in the last days. And folks, our freedoms are going to be stripped away. And you're going to be forced 
to worship in a way that is contrary to the Word of God and you'll be threatened with boycott, you'll be threatened with a death decree and there are miracles happening all over the place. The devil is a master at making wrong look right and right look wrong. Everything inside of you is going to say that it must be right that you're following the lamb when it's actually the beast and the lamb is going to be made to look like the beast. Only those who know the lamb from the scripture can tell the difference between the two. Then chapter 14, here comes the good part. Verse 6, I saw another angel flying in the midair. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Every living being on earth is going to hear the truth about God when the beast is doing his deceptions to try to gather the world into worshiping the beast. God has a message. The hour of God's judgment has come. Now is the time. Worship the creator, not the creature. The beast is the creature. God is the creator. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water because the hour of God's judgment has come. Second angel, Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people. Third angel, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark, he'll also drink the wine of the wrath of God. The whole world is forced to choose. Either worship the beast, the beast says, or die. There will be a death decree. Or God says, worship the creator of the heavens and the earth, or you You'll drink the wine of the wrath of God. There'll be no straddling the fence. Just follow the lamb. Don't follow me. Don't follow grandma, grandpa, anyone. Follow the lamb. It's the only safety we're going to have through times like this. And then chapter 15. Three angels' messages go to the whole world. Everyone has been forced to choose one way or the other. And the Bible tells us Verse 5, I looked in heaven, that's the tabernacle, the temple was open, and out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen, wore golden sashes. One of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels the seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No one can enter the temple until the seven plagues were completed. In other words, every decision has been made. Everyone has had the opportunity to choose. Everyone sees, is worshiping either the beast or the creator. Everyone has either the mark of the beast or the seal of God on their foreheads. Then the plagues are poured out. Why? What purpose could God have with these awful plagues? Chapter 16, verse 1, I heard a loud voice from the temple saying, to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. First angel went and he poured out his bowl on the land and ugly, broke, painful sores broke out on the people who had worshipped the beast and his image. Not on God's people, only on those who worship the beast. The great tribulation won't come to you if you have the seal of God on your forehead. And then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it turned to blood. The third angel on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. In verse 5, then I heard a voice of the angel in charge of the waters saying, You are just in these judgments, you who are, who were the Holy One, because you have so judged, for they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets. You've given them blood to drink. Yes, Lord, just and true are your judgments. Now God is showing that he's doing the right thing, and everyone agrees when he destroys the wicked and delivers his people. Verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his bow on the sun. It was given power to scorch people with fire. But look at the end of verse 9. They refused to repent and glorify God. You see, Babylon claims to be the people of God. But as the plagues are poured out, they're beginning to demonstrate now they refuse to repent. They curse the name of God. They refused to glorify God. Verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl. The beast was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony. They cursed the name of God. Now we can understand the sixth plague. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water were dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. There's only one thing preventing Jesus from coming right now. He has to give Satan time to demonstrate what his kingdom was like. He has to give his people time to demonstrate what it's like to follow the Lamb. Watch this. Chapter 17, verse 1. 
one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and said to me, Come, and I'll show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. So one of the angels with the seven bowls is going to tell us about this prostitute and interpret it for us. She sits on many waters. What's her name? Verse 5, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and abominations of the earth. So here's Babylon the harlot, the counterfeit church, sitting on many waters just like Babylon of old. What do the waters symbolize? Verse 15, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are people, multitudes, nations, and languages. So there's the harlot sitting on waters. The people are the ones who give her her support. They give her her power. But the prophet said that the waters were going to dry up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. So Babylon will lose her power. She will lose her support. The people will recognize it. How does it happen? He continues on. Verse 10, the beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They'll bring her to ruin. They'll leave her naked. They'll eat her flesh. They'll burn her with fire. Because the people finally recognize that they have been led astray by their leaders, by their pastors, by their teachers teachers that's the darkness the darkness of the plague is the realization that the people they are persecuting are not receiving the plagues we are we have been deceived we have been led astray and now there are those who worship God and those who worship the beast they're marked they don't repent because they love God they don't repent because they trust God. They repent because they want all the privileges of being saved, but they don't want to have to trust God to live their lives the way he made us. But it's too late now. Everyone had their opportunity. It's going to be a dark time for God's church. It's going to be a time... Well, it seems like that if one more minute goes by, the church will be crushed away into darkness. Babylon is so powerful and strong. But at the darkest hour, God's people are going to look up and see a rider on a white horse. His name is the Word of God. On his head are many crowns. He's dressed in a robe, spotless and white, dipped in blood. And he has this name on his thigh, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. And God's people are delivered at a place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon.